sustainability, affordability and security of supply, main aims of, uh, uh, of, the, um, of the strategic goals of Europe, well known. Uh, interconnection broadly can help with all of those goals. Sustainability in terms of helping to connect renewables to the system right the way across Europe. Affordability, inter interconnectors in the form of cross-border trading are obviously key enablers to the creation of a single integrated European market. And also security of supply, which we've heard a little bit about today in terms of um, increased flexibility through, sh through shared operating margin. So as we start to look more closely at maximizing the benefit of interconnection, broadly two main areas to consider. Firstly, as I've alluded to, there's using existing interconnector capacity properly through the efficient allocation of that capacity and through operating efficiently in real time. And as we look to build new interconnectors, we have to look at what's appropriate for those. A number of things to consider here. What's the right size for interconnection? The right location? What's the right time to build them? How do we encourage the right returns on investment? And how do key parties across Europe work together to ensure optimization across the European scene as a whole? As a whole? Now, I'm going to talk very briefly about each of these areas um, over the forthcoming slides. I'm actually going to start with the challenges of new interconnector build and then move on to look at market operation, which has actually been covered a little bit this afternoon. So hopefully I can whack through that fairly quickly. So it would seem fairly obvious, I think, that a common regulatory approach across Europe would be a prerequisite to getting new interconnectors built. And for us in the GB, that, that's got fairly severe implications. Licence separation in GB means interconnector projects are justified solely on the basis of congestion rents covering investment and operating costs. And for this reason, all new GB interconnectors require exemption from the third package, particularly the use of revenue clauses, and exemptions aren't available to TSOs. So this really key difference between the GB regime from all other European, um, all other European uh, regulatory regimes has created a, si a significant barrier to interconnector development. The exemption criteria and other third package requirements, including TSO coordination and harmonisation of arrangements, have led to, to us, uh, have led the GB to look very closely at the interconnector reg regime. Broadly, it's looked at four models. Looked at the truly merchant model, uncapped, not available to TSOs, and given the Commission's appetite to grant exemptions, this is no longer really a viable option. It is, however, broadly how the GB end of the French interconnector works. Then we move to an exempt, an exempt regime, which is basically a regulated cap. Um, so, for instance, the BritNed interconnector, the interconnector between Holland and the UK, is, is exempt. There's a, there's a cap on the revenues, but there is no floor. The third model, the regulated cap and floor, this is a model where a proportion of the investment is driven by market testing, but consumers bear the upside as well as the downside in recognition of the wider socio-economic benefits of interconnection. And that's the model which is currently progressing. Fully regulated, model which most of our continental partners develop their interconnectors by. Investment costs are included in the RAB. There may be some incentives on availability, but by and large, there's no exposure to revenue volatility. So the, clap, the cap and floor, floor regime is being developed using actually the Belgian UK interconnector, the NEMO project, as a pilot. And initial principles were sent out by the regulators just before Christmas. Detail actually still to be worked up, but we expect this regime to apply to all our regulated interconnectors going forwards. It's important to add that it is still open for third parties to build truly merchant uh, interconnectors to, uh, to GB if they want to do so. So what about capacity and location? 
really important that you look at these projects in the entirety. You can't just consider the offshore cable. You've got to look at the, uh, at the onshore um, reinforcement that's necessary as well. And it's no doubt that interconnected development is hugely challenging. And the choice of location and size is a balance of many factors that play out there. Location for converted sites is usually in very well-developed coastal areas. The consents for both, those, for both onshore and indeed for the offshore work is typically in environmentally sensitive areas. And they're connecting at the edges of the transmission networks where spare capacity is limited and that leads to the need for greater reinforcement onshore. So funding and investment is also a key consideration as I've alluded to, but times are changing here. With the provisions of the third package for greater TSO cooperation <coughs> reflected in the cap and floor regime and the achieving of the wider policy goals that I talked about at, at the outset of firm aim, interconnectors do now need to be built for wider socio-economic benefits rather than solely with the interests of developers in mind. And this has led to some fairly major changes. Right size has to be taken into account. That takes into account price convergence versus, the, uh, versus maintaining an arbitrage advantage over the interconnector. Right location, as I've alluded to, optimizing the total project costs, offshore cable, onshore reinforcement, Particularly important now in GB, given the removal of locational signals provided by the transmission network use of system tariffs. And this may lead to some very complicated cost-benefit sharing as we move forward. So absolutely vital that there's a huge degree of coordination as we move forward. None of this will happen unless we've got coordination between all the relevant parties. And there are lots of parties in play here. Commission, with enabling tools like the Energy Infrastructure Package to promote greater interconnection between countries. Member States need to enact the legislation to facilitate that development. ASA, responsible for development of the, uh, of, of the uh, framework guidelines and the network codes, um, which they pass on to the, to the ENSOs to develop. Also really got a major part to play in aligning the regulatory regimes across Europe. National regulators obviously come into play, and we've seen in GB that the GB regulator has been investing a lot of time to try to bring the GB regime more into line with its European counterparts. Um, obviously, as well, a huge part for the TSOs to play, uh, as they are responsible for actually building these interconnectors. And of course, there may also be third-party developers in the mix who are also vital to that um, increasingly interconnected picture that you see there on your slide. Next slide. Uh, not to be outdone, I've also got this slide as well. <laughs> so I will not, I will not go through it because it's it, it's been gone through it's been gone through quite a bit today. I think we've all realised that there's that that, that, that the, there is now. Um, a greater degree of separation between the forward markets and the day-ahead implicit auctions, um, and that the N NWE initiative actually hopes to have the intraday, uh, intraday solution enforced by the end of this year, and that will incorporate a large part of the European scene. And capacity is currently traded on, on the French interconnector through explicit auctions, that's annual, monthly, daily, hourly, etc., uh, the daily explicit auctions on the French interconnector will be replaced by the NWE implicit auctions, and we're already in the process of changing those systems to enable GB to plug into the NWE model. So lastly, to real-time operation, another fundamental point if we're going to, if we're going to satisfactorily integrate increased inter interconnection into, into, our, uh, into our markets. Cross-border balancing went live on the French interconnector in December 2010. Uh, service was developed as part of a wider strategy of, of FUI, that's the French, UK, Ireland Regulatory Forum set out in the third energy package. And this bilateral service consists of both TSOs exchanging 10 upward and 10 downward prices for every hour of the day. And broadly, its purpose is to provide a balancing tool to vary the final post-gate flow on the interconnector to benefit consumers in both countries. 
Service on the French link has been shown to provide a tool by which TSOs can optimise the system at least cost. Uh, and we believe that, these, that such a system of operation is currently what's envisaged by both ENSO-E and the ASA framework guidelines which are being developed. So, my final slide. Really, just to reiterate, huge amount of opportunity out there. You've seen that from, from the earlier presentations this afternoon. Just a, a, an enormous amount to be done. As Daniel said, you know, we could also, we'd also very gratefully receive CVs as well. It is vital that we coordinate across those national boundaries. It's vital that at this early stage of getting that market up and running that there's, that there's great cr um, cross-border coordination. We've got to work on <coughs> and lead with the regulators and the policy, uh, policy makers in our respective jurisdictions and more broadly across Europe. And we've got to inform and go in tandem with our partners and indeed the customers and communities which we serve. So exciting times, lots of challenges there for the taking. Thank you very much.